the word Yahweh, uh, one of the words or names of God in the Hebrew, is this to be understood as a proper name or is Yahweh in fact in Hebrew describing something? It, it is a, a descriptive term. This is what I thought. Yeah, it's not the proper name. And uh, could you explain to me exactly what it is describing? It is usually translated, uh, uh, I, I am who I am, mm -hmm. something like that. But uh, more accurately, the tense, the tense, which in Hebrew it says Eheye, Asher Eheye, is a future tense. And therefore it means I will be whoever I will be in context, in context of the whole biblical tale and with the throwback to the Sumerian information that I provide in my books. It really means I can be whoever I choose to be. Mm -hmm. Who really God with the capital G was, is, and will be. Yes. That, I think, is a very important point that Christians need to understand because so many Christians today, especially fundamentalists, have a set concept in their mind, a, a pat religious belief system, and it does not seem to fit with the ancient and original Hebrew, and that's why I'm mostly concerned with establishing what did the original Hebrew words mean and and uh, try and get a better handle on where we're going in our Western world religion. There was a, uh, a professor I heard once talking about Yahweh and why I was interested in it, and he said it also implied uh, stored power that it, when it is released, it's, it's, it has something to do with power being released, the creative power being released. Does that well, that, that, that would not flow from this term, Yahweh, uh, that is, uh, whatever, <laughs> an expansion uh, into this uh, particular professor's uh, theology or beliefs. But obviously, uh, if you uh, contemplate, uh, first of all, uh, with the logic that God granted us, God with the capital G, mm -hmm. uh, you would say the following, well here we are on this planet called Earth by us and intelligent life evolved here according to the Sumerians helped along a little by the yes. Anunnaki from Nibiru but there was evolution uh, which is by the way described very scientifically in the first chapter of Genesis. All those who think that there's a contradiction between Bible and evolution are totally wrong. Mm -hmm. So here we evolved and we uh, uh, philosophically and otherwise uh, say uh, there is God, God a creator of heaven, or of earth and of everything here. Now we say maybe there was, there is, there could be definitely uh, life on Mars, mm. another planet. Another question is, let's say so. Let's say that some beings evolved on Mars uh, with our mental capacity. Uh, did they have their own God? In other words, is there God of Earth and God of Mars and yes. God of another planet? Mm -hmm. Now you say, no, 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 that, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. There must be one God, whatever yeah, one we God. mean by that, of, of, of our whole solar system. Mm -hmm. Earth, Mars, doesn't matter. You say, okay, now we are discovering, which was logically, mathematically presumed before, we are discovering that there could be other solar systems and other planets around other stars or suns, and uh, life could have evolved there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Zechariah Sitchin and uh, mm -hmm. Jordan are sitting and discussing this whole issue, and they say, well, uh, Yes, uh, that solar system where uh, uh, the seventh planet exists, etc. They have their God, their creator of. But but we have our God. In other words, each each solar system has a creator. Does this make sense? No. So you end up, if you really have an open mind, mm -hmm. uh, with saying there must be one power to use the term that you mentioned from that professor. One power 
uh, one creator, one God, whatever we mean by that, yeah. that created everything, and not only created, in my opinion, but even determined the course of events from beginning to end, and not only in uh, uh, faiths like as, as ours, but at the end of my book, uh, Divine Encounters, I give a translation of a um, Hebrew prayer, mm -hmm. uh, which is called the Lord of the Universe, uh, which clearly says that uh, this concept of Lord of the Universe, not of a solar system, not of a planet, uh, was there uh, before anything began mm -hmm. and will be there after everything ends. And, you know, a conference dealing with catastrophes might as well hear this, Absolutely. what I'm saying. Yes. That God will be there even after the last catastrophe. <laughs> yes. So uh, this is really the concept of God. Now, how does it fit in uh, with uh, the Sumerian tales of Anunnaki, who came here from another planet in our own solar system? How does it dovetail uh, with the tales in the Bible? It dovetails by saying that this entity, whether it has a shape, whether it has a form, I don't know, acts through emissaries. And this is the meaning of what God answered Moses. Mm. He says, I can be whatever, whoever I want to be. So I can be Enlil, I can be Enki, because they are only my emissaries. Yes. And this, I think, is the truth of what we have to understand from the Bible. Yes. There, I attended a lecture once uh, with a Lee and Vivian Gladden, who I think I have mentioned before uh, to you in passing, that uh, wrote a book uh, about the same subject. I think it was called uh, Heirs of the Gods, where they talked about the celestials or the extraterrestrials or whatever, and, and they made the point that there were only two scriptures in the Bible, both old and new, where the word God implied a divine, overshadowing, creative force in all creation, as opposed to all the other places, except those two, that talked about Elohim, which was different from the word... These are gods with a small g. Right. This must be understood. These are gods with a small g, who in turn were the emissaries of God with the capital G. And in the New Testament, on which I'm not as, as, as an expert as I'm on the Old Testament, but even there, uh, there is the statement uh, that uh, I'm Alpha mm -hmm. and I'm Omega. Omega. I'm the, the first beginning. and I'm the last, I'm right. the beginning and I'm the end, which is exactly what the Hebrew prayer states. That's a fascinating, uh, there were so many questions in relation to that, but uh, I'm very interested in the sons of God also. That is, um, were the Elohim the sons of the sons of God, or were the Elohim they were the, the sons Anunnaki. of God? And it is their sons born on earth who married the daughters of Adam. So then we could say then, they, then what you're saying is the Elohim were the ones that in the Hebrew is referred to as the sons of God. Uh, no, the Elohim are the, what the Sumerians called Anunnaki, okay. those who from heaven to earth came. Mm -hmm. They are Elohim in the Bible. In, indeed, when you encounter this term, uh, and, and mostly in connection with the so-called pagan gods mm -hmm. that are also called Elohim in the Bible. Uh, indeed, at some point, uh, um, uh, Joshua uh, gives the Israelites, before they cross the Jordan into the Promised Land, yeah, they I say, you now have a choice, like make up your mind. Mm -hmm. Do you want to follow the Elohim of Egypt? Uh, do you want to follow the Elohim of Mesopotamia? Mm -hmm or do you want to follow Yahweh as the monotheistic concept of one God that rules, controls, designs, etc., everything? You know, uh, the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, I think it's 423 in Daniel, says uh, that he was given a vision by God where he saw the earth and it was in a total, uh, the words were, 
uh, a desolation, a destruction and a desolation of the world and a vision taking him back to an ancient time. That reminded me of Genesis 1-2 where it says that uh, God created the heavens of the earth or Elohim created the heavens of the earth. You raise a very, very fundamental question for biblical scholars and that's for theologians. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, the sentence, the verse says Bereshit, which is translated in the beginning, mm. Elohim, God, created the heaven and the earth. Mm. And many, many uh, theologians for generations, even goes back to Talmudic times, you know, even the time of the temple, the second temple, asked how could it be that the story of creation, of beginning, starts with the second letter of the alphabet, the bet, the beta, the B, and not with the first letter of the alphabet, mm. the aleph, the alpha. It just beats logic, beats your beliefs. And what I show in my uh, book, the last, the latest one, Divine Encounters, is that if you add the Aleph, which may have dropped somewhere along the rewritings, etc., mm -hmm. of the Bible, it becomes that not Bereshit, Av Reshit, mm. the father of beginning, created Elohim, the heaven and the earth. Oh. Okay. So the Supreme Creator created the, the Anunnaki, Elohim, the heaven and the earth. And that is a whole different and subject. That I really hope uh, that uh, through, through this interview and, and, and all, all, <laughs> all, all the uh, exposure that it will thus give, that uh, those who uh, uh, have the say in these matters would really consider this suggestion by me that uh, if you add the Aleph, mm -hmm. you give a whole new dimension to this first sentence of the first book of the Bible. Very, very interesting, very important, I feel. Uh, the second scripture where it says, and in, and in that time God created the heavens of the earth and the earth was, a, was without form and void. I am told, and as I have researched this, that it can be equally and legitimately translated a different way. Rather than the earth was without form and void, it can be translated the earth was a waste and a desolation or became a waste and a desolation, implying that there was already an, uh, uh, an earth situated, then came a great destruction, and then the earth became a waste and a void. So that uh, the implications from what I can gather is that Genesis 1-1 is saying what you have established, and then Genesis 1-2 is saying that the earth that we have today is a recreation or a new situation because it was an earth in former times that was destroyed. Well, there are these uh, interpretations of how to understand uh, that verse, but of course there is a Sitchin interpretation no. <laughs> right. uh, because uh, it is clear, uh, not just to me, to all scholars, uh, that uh, the, the story of creation and then continuation, the Tower of Babel, the Garden of Eden, and of course the deluge, mm. uh, the great flood, are really uh, versions, um, concise versions based on the earlier Sumerian writings. Mm -hmm. People have to remember that Abraham was a Sumerian. And uh, therefore, uh, that uh, if these are versions of the Sumerian epic of creation mm -hmm. and Nomailish, then the words Tehom, Tehom Rabbah, which are con translated as uh, chaos and, and all the other terms that you have mentioned, uh, uh, really refer to Tiamat, Rabbah, Tiamat the Great, the Great Tiamat, and therefore it is precisely uh, what the Sumerian texts say, that there was another planet 
that perished in the celestial battle and the collision. And therefore, the interpretation that you mentioned, though, it is not, uh, it is not linked to the, uh, uh, to the words or to the name Tiamat, links to the same meaningful result. In other words, that Earth mm -hmm. is the result of a celestial catastrophe. There was a catastrophe from which our the planet Earth emerged. From. Right. Yeah. So it leads to the same conclusion in different ways, and maybe it's good that yeah. uh, you know two two approaches lead to the same conclusion. Yeah. But I I have always felt that there was most likely um, another civilization, ancient civilizations, even before. And this is just my own conjecture, that even before the ones that we know of. Definitely, definitely. You're, you're absolutely right on that, because uh, even uh, according to the Sumerian tales, and especially, uh, I mean, many texts, but especially the so-called uh, King List, mm -hmm. uh, that deals with the cities, pre-antediluvial cities, and with the ten uh, anti, not anti, but anti, with an e, mm -hmm. uh, preceding the deluge, uh, ten rulers, which some compare to the ten patriarchs in the Bible before the deluge. Uh, and uh, there, was, there were cities, there was a civilization. Uh, the Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, boasted that he could read tablets from the, for the, the flood. So all the indications are uh, that they recognized, referred to, and accepted this fact that there was a civilization, but a civilization of the gods. Mm -hmm. Because those cities, pre deluvial are, are spoken of as cities of the gods. Right. After the deluge, there came cities of men with the help of the Anunnaki. So there was a time of a, let's call it a divine divine civilization, divine culture. As you, I'm sure, know, uh, in the Egyptian uh, beliefs, uh, the priest Maneto, mm -hmm. who paralleled the uh, Chaldean Berossus, mm -hmm. they lived more or less at the same time, and uh, the heirs of Alexander in, uh, in what became eventually Byzantine, uh, hired a Babylonian priest to write the history of the world of mankind based on the Mesopotamian mm. and the Ptolemies in Egypt uh, hired uh, the priest, Egyptian priest Maneto to do the same. Uh, but the versions are very similar, both by the way spoke of uh, a series of calamities mm -hmm. that preceded the deluge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear at what intervals calamities that would have preceded the deluge. Yeah, 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 the deluge was just one of them, uh -huh. the most, the most uh, remembered one, yeah. right? Uh, according to Berossus, indeed, uh, they were uh, alternating. There were calamities by heat and fire, mm -hmm. and then there were calamities by water and, uh, and cold, etc. And Maneto also spoke about uh, dynasties of the gods, very uh, which is the Sumerian yes. gods, because I show in my books that they were one and the same, and that if you ask yourself what do the names mean, you see that the names meant the same, except mm -hmm. this was in ancient Egyptian, this was in Sumerian, or later Babylonian, Akkadian. And then he said there was a, a period, uh, according to Maneto, of almost 3,600 years, of demigods, which meant offspring, of the Anunnaki, like the sons of God in the Bible says, married the daughters of men and mm -hmm. had children by them. Yes. And these would be called demigods. Right. And then only began the human civilization with the pharaohs around 3100 BC. So uh, what you are uh, stating <laughs> yeah. uh, very, uh, very uh, succinctly is really uh, can be supported and expanded by all these uh, records from the past, some available more or less complete, many just in fragments. Well, you know, about 20 years ago, I talked with the president of the American Rabbinical Association, who was a good friend of mine, and we used to carry on long conversations over the phone. 
and I ask him about um, in Genesis 9, I believe it is, where this is after the flood of Noah's day, God says to Noah to go forth with his sons and daughters, I mean, sons and wives, and go forth and multiply and replenish right. the earth. Right. Re obviously right. means do right. again. Right. And uh, yes, that's understood. It was to, and obviously to redo the earth because God had destroyed so much of the uh, life. But then again, if you go back, as I said to him, if you go back to Genesis uh, 1, I believe it's 28, where God creates Adam and Eve, and, it's, and he's telling the original couple to go forth, reproduce, and replenish the earth. Do it again. No, the word again does not appear there. It says, uh, uh, be, be, be fruitful in terms of having mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, offspring, uh, revu, multiply, and fill the earth. The, 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 but it does the not word, have re no, replenish? No, well, no. Well, in the original, not, well, in, not, in some not, of the not Bibles, regarding it says Adam, well, yeah. That's what I, that well, was the question. Well, these are the dangers of translations. I know. Uh, you know, the translators uh, really in interpret. Yeah. No. Uh, there are so many questions I know that I have wanted to ask in relation to the word L, L, E, L, L being one of the, was L in fact a Hebrew word as such, or was L existing before the Hebrew language? L is the Hebrew for what, uh, Hebrew stems from Akkadian. Okay. All Semitic languages stem from Akkadian. Uh -huh. Canaanite, uh, Phoenician, uh, Phoenician yeah. uh, Moabite, Right. Etc. stem from, from Akkadian, uh, which was the language <coughs> that uh, came after the demise of, of the Sumerian civilization uh, a little before, and uh, Babylonian, Assyrian. Mm -hmm. right. So when I read uh, an Assyrian text, it's almost like Hebrew, I mean, mm -hmm. not exactly, the dialects and so on. So. Uh, so the Hebrew word El, which is usually translated uh, God mm -hmm. or uh, divine being, mm -hmm. uh, really is from the Akkadian Ilu, I-L-U. I-L-U, yes. I-L-U. Yes. Uh, and uh, it, it meant uh, literally the lofty one. Mm. So if you want to be very precise, uh, you have to translate wherever it says El, uh, you have to say the lofty one. Now, I was asked... <coughs> you mean the elites? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the lofty one. You never know. You That's never right. know. Maybe elite comes from that. Yeah? Well, it was a new subject. <laughs> right. uh, the, uh, I was asked, for example, by uh, my brother uh, about... He says, well, if Yava I told Moses, who persisted to know, what is your name, what is your name? Uh, he said to him, call me, whatever, or tell, tell, he really told him, tell the, the Israelites that Eheye Asher Eheye, whoever I want to be, I'll be sent you to be my spokesman, mm -hmm. emissary. Uh, so my brother asked me, uh, and, and then the, it says there that he says, I did not tell my name to Abraham or to Isaac. That's right, yes. So my brother said, so when Abraham referred to whoever told yeah. him, leave your home, go to Canaan, do this, do that. Who was he talking to? He, no, when, when he went to his wife, when he uh -huh. went to Isaac, okay. and said, I'm supposed to take you to Mount Moriah. Uh, who did he say? Who did he say told me that? Yeah. Good question, if he had no name. I said, well, we find an answer to that because uh, after um, Abraham uh, saved his nephew Lot from the attackers who came from Mesopotamia, you know, the war of the kings, the kings of the east against the kings, the Canaanite kings, he saved him. He was met at the gates of the future Jerusalem mm. by the high priest who offered him uh, bread and wine. And uh, he wanted to offer Abraham some uh, 
some of the booty, some mm -hmm. of the, you know, material. And then I said, no, 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 I did it because El Elyon instructed me to do it. El Elyon means the supreme El. Mm. Not the lofty one, which would be an Anunnaki, but the one above. who is above them, which takes you back to God with the capital G, etc., etc. I am I'm so very appreciative of your time, but I really have to ask you something that's important to me. In my particular uh, work in examining the uh, occult or hidden symbolism uh, in our modern-day religious and political movements, I became fascinated about 20 years ago with the symbol of the sun as it is used by the secret societies, the fraternal orders, and especially in our political and religious uh, symbolism today. It was fascinating to me that the sun, uh, when you brought up that uh, what we're talking about, or it was, uh, I guess David Talbot even talked about the, the sun being Saturn. But the sun has been used, uh, that sun symbol with the, uh, with the winged, the winged sun you brought out was the symbol of the Anunnaki? And the symbol of Nibiru, of the so-called 12th planet. All right, so that implies... Because that as I showed you on these monuments, which I shall just do mm -hmm. of that, uh, I could choose many more. Uh, and that symbol, by the way, also appears on Egyptian monuments yes, and does. Hittite monuments. Yeah. Right. This was uh, the the symbol uh, connecting the king, the priesthood with with their gods, with the small g. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the symbol of the planet. And as I showed on the same monument, which gives the twelve members of the solar system, <coughs> you definitely see the sun you know, with its rays, mm -hmm. totally separate, and the symbol of the, what's called the winged disc, and oh, Earth. Okay, Earth so you see them simultaneously a, together. On the same depictions, yeah. which are repeated and repeated, and you see Earth as the seventh planet. Mm -hmm. uh, in many instances, you see Venus as the eighth planet mm -hmm. with eight rays. Mm -hmm. Uh, you see Mars as the sixth planet with six rays, so every, everything corroborates what, yes. what I've written. Well, the, the, the sun, as I said, is a, is a particularly important symbol to me uh, because uh, I see it uh, in so many uh, political and religious depictions and symbols. And, of course, with the coming of uh, Christianity, the concept that the Messiah is God's son, and I believe that there can be a, a, a comparison made between the ancient uh, a veneration of the sun, S-U-N in our language, as opposed to a veneration of the individual, S-O-N, um, and I think probably that has some problems with our languages and interpretation. But um, what do you think about the symbol of the sun itself and the importance to the ancients like the uh, Sumerians etc. Well if you're talking about the winged disc then this this stood for the planet from which the Anunnaki came. Mm. Uh, in in uh, Sumerian times with the ensuing Babylonian and Assyrian the sun god uh, Utu in Sumerian, Shamash mm -hmm. in, in Hebrew and all the other languages was not a significant deity at all in the hierarchy. Uh, the Shamash, according to the Sumerian, and therefore further on believed by the Assyrians, Babylonians, and others, was the son of uh, the god that uh, in Akkadian is called Sin, mm -hmm. not from sinning, no, but no, uh, was it really was from Sumerian Suen, and uh, he was the moon god. Mm -hmm. So according to these hierarchies, yes. uh, Shamash was the son of the moon god. Mm -hmm. uh, not so when it came to Nibiru. Uh, the ruler of Nibiru stood at the head of the pantheon. Mm. Okay. So the pantheon had to do with the Anunnaki from where they came and the ruler there was the head and his symbol was the winged disc. So uh, this really has to do with all these uh, misconceptions about uh, who the ancient peoples really worshipped uh, whether that's it what was, I'm trying to get yeah, to, yeah. Uh, 
and, and, and many books written, especially uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of this century, say they were, uh, these or those people were sun worshippers, mm. and this was a sun religion, and uh, the Egyptian gold Ra. I mean, the same people who, who, who spell it Re, R-E, then go and write the name of the pharaoh Ramses. Ramses, which means issue emanating from Ra. So when they say the name of the Pharaoh, they say Ra, but when they say spell the name it. of the God, they yeah. spell it Re. So right. It's Ra, it's mm -hmm. Ra, because it also appears in the Bible. Uh, so uh, they say he was the sun god, he was not the sun god. Uh, he was a, the god who came from the planet of millions of years, which mm -hmm. is the parallel of Nibiru, a planet, definitely a planet, not the sun. So that there's so many misconceptions uh, that it may take a century to get rid of yep. uh, because it's an accumulation of uh, well, two I, or three I centuries have, of uh, research. In my collection, I have about four or five, I think it's five, um, two of them are doctoral theses and others are, are, are articles, long extended articles appearing uh, in the Middle East on the word chief cornerstone. Uh, and I picked up on that. That was a fascinating study where the word chief cornerstone uh, is translated from the Hebrew when it appears in Hebrew, which is, I think, uh, Psalms 118.22, where Messiah is referred to as the chief cornerstone. Uh, well, while in the, uh, the Christian Greek scriptures of the New Testament, the Messiah or Jesus is referred to twice as the chief cornerstone. That word, chief cornerstone, what does that actually imply for the Messiah in both Psalms and, uh, and in the Greek? Have you... It is not cornerstone. In other words, when you lay the foundation, you have a cornerstone. Right. It's the apex stone, Rosh Pina, the head where, where the sides meet, like in a pyramid, the apex stone. The top stone, the one that is really the conduit to the heavens. Yeah, because I, I, that's what these articles were all saying. Everyone was saying it was the pinnacle of uh, pinnacle, of a, a pinnacle, pinnacle. Yes, but not but foundation not stone on the right. ground. Now the big question, of course, obviously, is going to be on the back of the one dollar bill. Of course, is the Egyptian pyramid with the 72 stones of the 72 names of God, I believe. But uh, the implication with the apex that, with floating the apex, heavenward, right? Yeah. Uh, and if that is, which is, is the, fact, Mas the Masonic symbol, that's right? right. But it is also, as you brought out, the word actually in Hebrew in Rosh Psalm 18, yeah. which means the peak of the. Pinnacle. The pinnacle and remember, stone. even in the New Testament, when Satan uh, uh, takes Jesus uh, to the temple to tempt him, the scripture says he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple, to the point of the temple. Uh, I am totally sure that there's a lot of, of um, symbolism that the uh, early... Yeah. That I the think early we should writers. rewrite the Bible yeah. in English, not in Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's very important As a matter of fact, I was thinking about a new translation based on my understanding of it. I think that would be a, absolutely important for so many people in the Western world to get a better grasp on the symbolism, the implications of the original words, where they came from, and just get a new understanding from where all of this is came. Is there anything else you might tell us about that symbol of the uh, the pinnacle or the uh, the chief cornerstone, and how uh, how that might be of importance to us, particularly in this time that we're living, when everyone seems to be in the, especially in the in the uh, Christian world, looking for the Messiah. Um, what would be your thoughts on the concept of the Messiah being the chief cornerstone? Because I, I will go on, on record as saying, I think that there is an entire story here that needs to be looked at. This whole concept of a coming kingdom of God, the messianic kingdom, the chief cornerstone, the ancient gods, uh, 
Uh, there seems I to think be... That the, the literal translation, even from the New Testament, is the, not just the second coming, the mm. second, but the return, the return mm. of the kingdom of heaven, right? Ah, uh, yes, return. That brings us to probably... To the conclusion uh, of this interview. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the planet, Nibiru, is there anything I can have you say concerning the return of Nibiru that you... Not yet, but okay. I promise you another interview I promise. When, I, uh, when I can speak about it. Let me again say that it is not only a pleasure but an honor to be with you, and well, I do very much appreciate your time. It's always a pleasure uh, to uh, be interviewed by someone uh, who knows uh, almost as much as I do. <laughs> right. I leave a little for myself. <laughs> you are a giant, thank and, and you. I thank appreciate you, your time. Thank you thank very you. much. Bye-bye. And thank you very much for watching.